In the last two weeks, I've been making videos about Ukraine, specifically pertaining to the Russian invasion of Ukraine. But in today's video, I'd like to look at the allies of Russia inside Ukraine itself, particularly the two rebel republics in the east of Ukraine in an area called the Donbass. And today, I'd like to find out more about their role in the conflict, how they came about, and how the people of the Donbass feel about this conflict between Ukraine and Russia. Before starting, I'd quickly like to give this disclaimer that in videos like this, where I'm talking about controversial topics, I might be explaining what's going on, but that isn't the same as justifying what's going on. So while I might give the perspective of people in the Donbass and why certain individuals acted in a certain way, that isn't the same as me endorsing it. With that said, for a fuller view of the complete context and backstory to what's happening in Ukraine at the minute, the region of the Donbass sits in the very far east of Ukraine, and it's named after the Don River, which also flows through Russia. Now, it's long been a very ethnically and linguistically diverse part of the country. A census from back when the region was part of the Russian Empire in 1897 shows that the largest ethnic group there were Ukrainians, or in the language of the time, Little Russians, followed closely by Russians themselves and with minorities of ethnic Greeks, particularly along and in the coastal city of Mariupol, Jews, Tatars and Germans. Now, what's interesting is the distinction between where the little Russians, so what we would call Ukrainians, and Russians proper were living, most Ukrainians being rural, out-in-the-countryside farmers, while those in the cities were more likely to be speaking Russian itself. This is largely due to the fact that ethnic minorities in the Russian Empire would often use Russian as a lingua franca to speak to others who didn't necessarily speak their own ethnic language. From 1918, following the Bolshevik Revolution of a year earlier in Russia, parts of the Donbass were ruled by the Ukrainian People's Republic and then by various anarchist insurgent armies known as the Black Army, and finally it was incorporated into the Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic, allied to the soon-to-be victorious Bolsheviks in Moscow. During the time, it was a difficult period for Donbass, as decossackization targeted the Cossacks who'd lived in the region, and in 1922, the Holodomor famine also resulted in the deaths of many, particularly the rural Ukrainian population. As part of the Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic, it would attract many Russians to the area, particularly because of the extensive coal and steel industries in the Donbass region. They needed workers to come and to carry out the necessary labor in these industries. And therefore, many Russians, Russian speakers, came to the Donbass, and it was sometimes referred to as the heart of Russia. During the Second World War, the industry of the Donbass was a key target for Hitler's armies, and as such, many industrial workers were plundered from the region to work in German and Polish factories for the Axis. Following the Second World War, however, there was another great influx of immigrants, particularly from Russia and other parts of the Soviet Union, to replenish those who had died during the war, numbering some hundreds of thousands. In 1926, for example, the number of ethnic Russians in the Donbass numbered around 640,000, whereas around 30 years later, in 1959, this number was greater than 2.5 million. With this large number of Russians living inside the Donbass region, it's perhaps no surprise that in 1990, when the Soviet Union was falling apart and there was talk of a referendum on Ukrainian independence, in the Donbass region, the Interfront of Donbass was created to oppose the separation of Ukraine and Russia, and particularly Donbass from being separated with Russia as well. However, it appears that this was a rather insignificant political position, as around 84% of voters in the Donbass region voted for Ukrainian independence. While the vast majority of those living in Donbass were in favor of joining Ukraine and so separating from Russia, the political position of federalization was particularly strong here, basically meaning that they didn't want a highly centralized government around Q, but more regional autonomy in the area for them to decide their own matters. The first years of the independent Ukrainian state were, to put it mildly, bleak, particularly in eastern Ukraine and in the Donbass region. 
by 1993, wages had on average fallen by about 80% and poverty was widespread. In that year, there was a miners' strike based on the coal miners who had for a long time been an important part of the industrial heritage of the Donbass region. They were met with a violent Ukrainian police response. And in 1994, political pressure mounted to the point where there was a referendum on certain points of political autonomy inside the Donbass region. This referendum consisted of four questions. One, whether Ukraine should seek closer ties with the Commonwealth of Independent States, a Russian-aligned group of states in Eastern Europe and Central Asia that had close economic as well as political ties. Secondly, whether Ukraine should federalize so that various regions would have more autonomy and decentralized power from the central government in Kyiv, whether Ukraine should admit Russian as a second official language after Ukraine, seeing as a majority of people in Ukraine speak Russian as a first language, and finally whether Russian should be given official status inside the Donbass region where the vast majority of people spoke Russian as a first language. This poll was met with 90% success in the Donbass region. However, in the years to follow, none of these proposals would be admitted by the central government in Kyiv, and so the unrest continued, with Donbass feeling increasingly unlistened to by the government. Well, during the late 90s and early 2000s, the conditions in Donbass did improve somewhat. Many mines were closed during this period and power became centralized in the hands of several oligarchs known as the Donbass clan. One of these oligarchs in 2004 was Viktor Yanukovych, who opposed the revolution that had occurred in Western Ukraine called the Orange Revolution, in which people wished to see less corruption and closer ties to Europe, and instead proposed the creation of the Southeast Ukrainian Autonomous Republic an area that would essentially split Ukraine in half, largely based on areas that had a larger Russian-speaking population and who felt closer to Russia politically, socially and economically, as opposed to those areas in the west and north of Ukraine that wanted to pursue closer ties to Europe. This plan fell through for several reasons, not least because it had strong opposition coming from nowhere else than Donbass itself. Partially as a result of the minor strikes of the 90s, the corruption of the early 2000s, and the fact that the region maintained far more old Soviet names of Soviet leaders and communist figures in its towns, cities, squares and street names, the Donbass region became for the rest of Ukraine a kind of cesspit of pro-Russian separatist sentiment, as well as a continuation of old Soviet support. And it was also strongly believed in other areas of Ukraine that if you spoke Ukrainian in Donbass, then you would be beaten up because it was only allowed to speak Russian there, a kind of thug culture that persisted. Now, this was largely that, just a stereotype as polls throughout the 1990s showed that pro-Russian sentiments and separatism were a fringe position in the politics of Donbass, while most people had voted to be a part of Ukraine, albeit unhappy with the state of the Ukrainian government. This takes us up to 2014, when throughout large parts of western Ukraine, and particularly in the capital of Kyiv, there were large-scale protests against the president Viktor Yanukovych, who had turned back on his campaign plan pledge to allow Ukraine to enter the European Union. After he had done this, there were large-scale protests, and thanks to political pressure from Western countries and indeed from internal protesters, the Ukrainian parliament voted to oust Viktor Yanukovych, the pro-Russian president, and exchange him for a newly elected pro-European president, Petro Poroshenko. Now, this was met with in the south and east of Ukraine by large-scale protests in many cities. In Kharkiv, the second largest city in Ukraine, the regional state administration building was actually captured by protesters, and there was a plan to create another People's Republic there, but this was quashed by Ukrainian security forces and the city remained under Ukrainian control. However, in the very east of the Donbass region, in 
Luhansk and Donetsk, there was indeed an armed insurrection that was able to oust Ukrainian security and police forces from government buildings and therefore become de facto independent. Now, these two areas were in Donetsk in the south and in Luhansk in the north. And these two would become the separatist regions of Ukraine. Let's start with Luhansk. Luhansk is often referred to as the LPR for short, the Luhansk or Lugansk in Russian People's Republic. It's also sometimes referred to with the acronym LNR, which is the Luganskaya Narodnaya Respublika, which is just the Russian name for the Luhansk People's Republic. Now, in the south, around the city of Donetsk, you have the DPR, which again stands for the Donetsk People's Republic, sometimes also referred to as the DNR, which is just the Russian name of the Donetskaya Narodnaya Respublika. Now, the astute watchers will have noted that these two self-declared People's Republic sound fairly communist. And they have indeed gone back to adopting the constitution of the period when Stalin was in control. And as I mentioned, there was that stereotype that Donbass was a more communist region. And while that is partially a stereotype, there is also quite some truth to it. In Donetsk, for example, there is an almost 14 meter tall steel statue of Lenin that still stands. These two states are also the only ones now in Europe that have capital punishment alongside Belarus, a pro-Russian power in the region. And businesses are uh, expected to, let's say, donate a large part of their earnings to the state, which is then redistributed. Those who fail to make the, quote, donation often end up disappearing into cellars and even into camps where there are widespread allegations of torture against any dissidents. Many of these dissidents also having disappeared from the region when the fighting was occurring and when the rebels took over. After holding referendums that were widely considered fraudulent on their own independence, these two groups and their armed militias further branched out to capture more territory in the region, acting as independent entities from one another, although clearly being allied. They moved into the region and were able to capture quite a few towns and cities in the wider Donetsk area. Now, the Ukrainian army and several militia battalions formed and launched what they called an anti-terrorist operation and were able to recapture large parts of the Donbass, although to this day around, I believe, a third of the region is still in hands of these rebels. And with the current Russian invasion, it's not entirely clear what the future of this region will be following this. Now, Russia, of course, was very keen to have these rebel areas succeed. And while they didn't officially recognize the two, they gave them tacit support, particularly in the forms of military vehicles and munitions, as well as eventually Russian soldiers that were unofficially there and didn't have any Russian insignia. But there is an overwhelming amount of evidence that Russian soldiers entered to fight alongside the separatists, perhaps even making up as much as 70% of the separatist force while the Kremlin consistently denied that there were any Russian soldiers there, saying if there were any Russians, they were not acting under their orders, but were rather volunteers who wished to help these people's republics. Many countries around the world remain very sceptical about this definition of volunteer. At the same time, they started to hand out official documentation, such as, for example, birth and marriage certificates, as well as around 800,000 Russian passports to citizens living in the Donbass area, clearly prepping for some kind of takeover of these two areas should they wish to join Russia. These two rebel states did at one point also plan to merge together and become one single autonomous region known as Novorossiya. Now this is a term which means new Russia and was actually a term used to describe the region back in the communist period. But after some discussions in 2015, this plan ultimately fell through and the two, while they remain allied, still rule themselves independently. 
This takes us up to the 21st of February 2022, when in a speech, President Vladimir Putin of Russia recognized the two rebel states officially, thus giving them a nation status in the eyes of Russia, as well as some of its international allies like Cuba, Venezuela, Syria and Nicaragua. And now in 2022, with the Russian invasion of Ukraine in full swing, Russian forces on the ground in eastern Ukraine are being supported by forces of the LNR and DPR against the Ukrainian armed forces. And only the future will tell what kind of situation the east of Ukraine will be in when this terrible conflict finally ends. That's why I'd like to give around half of the proceeds from this video to various charities that are helping refugees to escape from Ukraine and also helping them once they have actually got out of the country and the war zone. No one deserves to be caught in a war, particularly those who cannot defend themselves and didn't ask for it. And that is precisely the situation that the civilians of Ukraine are in. And that's why I'll be leaving some links in the description below so that if you can and would like to, you can also donate to various charities that are helping people to escape. Now, that is the end of this video. Let me know in the comments below if you enjoyed this one, finding out a little bit more about the history of the Donbass region. It's an incredibly complex topic and I definitely could have mentioned a lot more things, but I hope this gives a basic introduction to this video about the Donbass and why these two rebel republics have occurred. It's a particularly interesting topic and I remember following it a couple of years ago as uh, events were developing on, on the front there in the sort of proxy war that was going on uh, with some people referring to it as a civil war while others don't like that term because of course the Russians were very much actively involved in both the creation of these rebel republics and in keeping them going with Russian volunteers, weapons and money etc. Let me know if you enjoyed this video in the comments below. I always like to see the discussions that go on. And what other videos would you like to see about the current situation in Ukraine and its history? Look forward to seeing you all in the comments below. And I hope everyone has a good day for the rest of it. Until then, or until now, I have been Hilbert and this has been The History.